Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are here for our discussion with uh, Department of Energy and some industry personnel on energy security policy and the implementation of the executive order on securing the U.S. bulk power system. So before we begin, I'd like to just kind of give a background on uh, who's hosting this. And uh, so we are here uh, being hosted by the Center for Cybersecurity Policy and Law, which is a nonprofit organization that develops, advances, and promotes the best practice practices among cybersecurity professionals. Uh, it's a, the center provides a forum for thought leadership, and uh, it wants to include both industry as well as members of civil society and government entities uh, to talk about policy around cybersecurity and technology. The center seeks to leverage experience from leaders in the field uh, to ensure that we have a robust marketplace for security technologies that and encourage professionals, companies, and groups of all sizes to take steps to improve their cybersecurity practices. So I would like to thank the center for hosting today. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, um, Mr. Nicholas Anderson. He is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Security and Energy Restoration in the Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response at the Department of Energy. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nick to say a few words, and then we'll hop into Q&A. So Nick, all yours. Thanks so much, Ross. I really appreciate that intro, and thanks for having me here with you uh, today. I appreciate the work that you and the center have done to give us this forum to uh, have this back and forth with an industry, uh, an interested community of people. Uh, so I'm eager to discuss some of the specifics of uh, things that obviously have been getting a lot of attention lately, like the bulk power system EO with you, but I recognize that a lot of you in the audience uh, may not be familiar with the office that I serve in, uh, that Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response. So I want to take a few minutes and just talk about that work and what we do on behalf of the Department of Energy and give you kind of that quick over, uh, overview of what we do in coordination with other agencies, with state and local governments, and uh, most importantly, with the energy sector, which I hope will set the stage for a good segment of our conversation today. Uh, so as many of you recognize, energy is essential. You know, it powers our, you know, it powers and fuels our lives. It powers our economy, it is really at the apex of the critical infrastructure sectors and the support for those others that provide for vital life services. Many of those basic necessities that we've come to rely on require energy and all of those other critical infrastructure sectors are dependent upon that reliable source of energy. So we call this overall concept that we need to ensure is just broadly energy security, that secure, reliable flow of energy across the nation. A disruption, uh, whether it's a physical attack or a cyber attack on our critical infrastructure, could prove to be de devastating. It could impact lots of those other critical infrastructure segments, such as uh, hospitals, our water system, our transportation system overall, emergency services, as has certainly been highlighted uh, with its criticality over the last several months, the financial sector and government operations. So our energy sector overall includes electricity, uh, inclusive of conventional and renewable sources, natural gas, uh, liquid fuels like gasoline, diesel, jet fuels, uh, and in a natural disaster, we try to look at all of the tangible numbers associated with both those fuel sources and the fuel mix associated with it, uh, but also you know numbers of outages and try to tie in overall energy security and the dependency mix is required for secure operations. Um, so in, in tying things in with uh, with that, with how we've done things like the health pandemic. Uh, you know, we're talking about um, energy statistics as they allow for the support of both a new normal, of a higher degree perhaps of home-based uh, home based energy consumers, <clears throat> not as much uh, in the earlier months of the pandemic spread uh, with things like our manufacturing sector and some of the, the larger critical infrastructure sectors that we typically would have seen producing, consuming power. Uh, but also the critical dependencies that our healthcare and first responders uh, needed during that time. So the department has for a long time been responsible for what's called the Emergency Support Function 12 or ESF 12, which is part of the National Response Framework. That's our nation's scalable, adaptable framework for aligning key roles and responsibilities across the whole of nation during a time of disaster and emergency. Uh, since that issuance of things that are related to that, like EPD 21, our Presidential Policy Directive 21 in 2013, DOE uh, was further tasked formally to be a sector-specific agency for the energy sector. 
wanting all that federal government responsibility for securing our nation's energy infrastructure from all threats and hazards, nat like I mentioned, natural and man-made. In 2016, uh, when PPD 41 came about, uh, it was kind of a publicly acknowledged that despite uh, the prosperity that had been ensured through technology and the growth of technology, that uh, the cyber world presented threats that if realized and if uncoordinated, could present an unacceptable risk to our national security, our economic security, and our way of life. So DOE and recognizing that and the kind of critical role that cyber played overall in preparedness, response, and recovery. In that following year, then Secretary Perry uh, began the process to establish uh, the support and response functions within the department that led to the creation of our office of CSER. It's only a little more than two years, uh, two years old now, so it's still relatively new, especially in, uh, in government timelines. Uh, but it's taken on a, a large swath of responsibilities related to both critical infrastructure security and coordination for things like uh, maintaining the unique uh, sector-wide situational awareness uh, that allows us to collaborate better with our government partners and with our industry partners, whether this is mitigating cyber threats and vulnerabilities, orchestrating response and recovery, or building partnerships and research for greater information sharing to safeguard against all hazards. CSER in, uh, is in full pursuit of that mission, uh, the responsibility of the authorities, the roles that I mentioned on behalf of the departments and working to kind of strengthen energy sector preparedness and helping to coordinate incident response and recovery and accelerating that R&D and development of resilient energy delivery systems is focused on that all hazards nexus. That includes building coordinated emergency response capabilities by strengthening our government and industry communication, something that we exercise free, uh, frequently, and we continue to try to train to assure that uh, plans are actionable when an incident occurs, uh, whether it is earthquakes in Puerto Rico, like we saw in January, or whether it's a uh, uh, response for an earthquake, which hopefully uh, hopefully uh, does not uh, come to pass as earthquakes are exceptionally hard to plan for. Uh, but we saw one even just within the last hour, <clears throat> you know, a, a, five, a five plus magnitude earthquake around China Lake. Uh, so those are all things that our office continues to sort of plan for, and we try to advance the operational capabilities of the energy sector through tools and technologies to enhance that situational awareness and to enable operations even in a degraded state. Now, <clears throat> Caesar's R&D division, or our SEDS division, invests in those tools and technologies to help the sector prevent, detect, mitigate, and survive cyber incidents. Now, by co-funding industry, national lab, and university-led projects, with government and industry partners, we can really make strides in advancing those cybersecurity capabilities for our energy delivery systems. And this includes not only game-changing commercial products and partnerships in that arena to enhance energy infrastructure survivability and resiliency, but also about $70 billion annually invested in programs and platforms for information sharing, intel-informed analysis, and assessment of system components. These include programs like our C2M2, which is our cybersecurity capability maturity model. Um, that's our cyber assessment model for energy companies that's mapped to the NIST framework, uh, the development and deployment of technologies and programs to enhance the speed and effectiveness of threat and vulnerability info sharing, such as our CAT and Coyote programs uh, that are both among the industry as well as federal government to industry information sharing, and uh, national supply chain assessment program. So we'll talk a little bit more about later, like our Citrix program, which is our cybersecurity testing for resilient industrial control systems program. All of this really comes together to help us secure the nation from our adversaries, creating and exploiting vulnerabilities in the bulk power system technology. Uh, lastly, you know, we've uh, we most recently uh, started investing a good bit of our time in a what was uh, pre-COVID, a very relatively recently uh, released program called our Energy Sector Pathfinder Initiative, which is uh, intended to help advance uh, threat information sharing, improving joint training and education to understand systemic risk, and developing joint operational preparedness and response activities in partnership with our interagency partners over at DOD and DHS. Those activities are all primed for supporting the implementation of that bulk power system EO and meeting the goals that it outlines. So while that kind of one one view of CSER really can't do justice to the hard work that takes place within all the layers of responsibility and the coordination that we do with our state, local, tribal, and territorial energy sector partners, I hope it kind of helps paint a broad picture of what we're doing to do more than just making sure electrons and fuel moves, 
that energy in all forms enables us to do the things that we need to do across all sectors to translate into the protection of economic and national security. So uh, that that is a lot uh, that you covered covered down on. So I, I appreciate you taking us through it. Um, I think it, it, it's good to to let the audience know that in our in our prep, uh, I after you told me that initially, I uh, I kind of poked a little bit and said, how many people do you have with you? And you have very few FTE to support such a wide and broad mission space, uh, if if I'm not mistaken. So it's important to to, under, to really thank you for taking the amount of time you are today to to, to talk with us about this. Um, before we launch into questions, I do want to let the audience know that uh, as we go through this, I've got some questions that I'm going to ask, but then on the back end, if there are audience questions that you guys want to put in the, uh, the question and answer box in your screen, please do so. I'll be looking through those as well. Nick's agreed to answer some of those questions uh, on the back end if we, uh, if we have the time to do it. So uh, with that, I want to kind of start off at the point where you, where you ended, which was you were talking about the Pathfinder program as a uh, an, an example of how you work with the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, another thing that we saw recently was the, the placemat that you put out talking about the ICS uh, best, best practices. You partnered with CISA and put that out. It was, it was a great document. I found it uh, very easy to read and understand, and, I, and I'm hoping our partners, and I think the partners in the industry did as well. So question for you is, do you think, or are there other uh, pieces of guidance or policies that you are currently working on with uh, the interagency or other partner agencies to help uh, move the ball forward from a from an energy security perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so what you're talking about is that uh, that recommended cybersecurity practices uh, for industrial control systems document that we put out. Uh, and that was really neat because uh, it wasn't just co-released with uh, DHS's Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, uh, but it also linked in our partners over in the UK with the National Cybersecurity Center. So that was a really neat opportunity uh, because when we look at the dependencies associated with critical infrastructure in particular, uh, it, it, it knows no bounds. Yeah, I know we say it in in, in cyber in cybersecurity uh, circles all the time, but uh, in particular with critical infrastructure, <clears throat> it really knows no bounds. And with the energy sector and the energy grid in particular, especially if you look at the North American uh, the North American electric system. Uh, now this was this was a pretty timely document uh, where we know that given the concern and the uptick that we've seen with those nation state actors trying to take advantage of the expanded attack surface of uh, COVID in particular in the remote work environment, uh, the energy sector internationally has been especially attractive targets. Uh, we've seen international reports of cyber intrusion attempts on energy systems and targeting energy sector companies everywhere from Taiwan to the UK, to the Middle East and elsewhere just during the, the pandemic. Uh, now, to, to answer your question, yeah, I, I think we're absolutely going to be partnering further on a lot of different products and a lot of different policies we're putting out, uh, you know, especially given CIS's role as the nation's risk advisor. Uh, we collaborate with them on, on so many different things, uh, whether it's just our regular engagements uh, with the sector that we try to do as collaboratively as possible, uh, or if it's with specifically named, named products uh, like this. We're also involved a lot within the interagency uh, where, where we do a lot of our advisory work to kind of contribute the value and the expertise specifically within the energy sector uh, with people like the National Security Council and, uh, and even reaching out uh, across the DOD and DHS lines again. Uh, we're, we just kicked off a new collaboration with the U.S. Service Academies. You know, we're welcoming in our first first group of interns uh, this year from the Coast Guard Academy. They're, they're the first ones in our inaugural Service Academies collaboration program. Uh, they're going to be interning, working specifically on some of these issues out at Idaho National Lab, working working there in Caesar Mission Space, kind of continue that further lash up between areas like the maritime transportation system and energy. And that's great. Um, that's that's helpful. That's good to know. Uh, is there any? I mean, on the horizon, is, are there are there in the near term horizon? I guess just just to push a little bit more, are, are there? areas that we should be focused on outside of the EO, which we'll get to in a second, but outside of the EO, are there other areas of, of ICS security that we should be uh, focused on for potential policy or guidance updates from you guys? Um, yep, yeah, so we're, we're absolutely, especially through our, our Pathfinder initiative, uh, we're looking at a lot of different elements right now where we're trying to jointly develop uh, 
playbooks uh, in the incident uh, in the incident response space. Our C2 into our uh, cybersecurity capability maturity model is getting ready to go into a version two launch uh, in the in the upcoming in the upcoming months. So that's going to be a new a new element that uh, that we're working on. Um, we've also got quite a few quite a few elements of new partnerships that we're going to be announcing uh, with the manufacturer space. Uh, a lot of it feeds into support for the EO and the support for manufacturers and kind of the bulk power system supply chain uh, that we're going to be that we're going to be launching as well. So there's there's quite a few upcoming uh, upcoming partnerships and kind of joint operational prep of the environment that we're going to be engaged in. Good, good. We look forward to hearing hearing more uh, about that. Um, okay, let's let's pivot to to the executive order now. Um, so one of the one of the areas that we have heard a lot about from from our uh, industry partners that, that uh, are in our orbit is um, kind of the who owns what. Um, we've heard a little bit about your office's role, um, but there are certain definitions and scopes who's doing what, can you help us, can you speak a little bit more to who owns what aspects of implementation of the EO and then specifically around clarification of some of the terminology. I know there was some some discussion around how some of this terminology will continue to get defined going forward. So if you could talk a little bit about those processes as well, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so especially if you look at the at the EO, there are a lot of elements uh, in discussion around things like uh, like pre qualification, which I think is is an important one for the industry. Um, so that that is going to be a lot of the work that you're going to see uh, our office in particular, that you're going to see Caesar involved in through some of our programs. We've been building a good solid baseline the last several years through things like Citrix. Uh, and the work across our national labs, um, and that that really is a uh, that's a, that's almost a whole of DOE complex effort uh, because that involves uh, multiple offices here at the headquarters level, as well as multiple national labs involved in discovering systemic and individual vulnerabilities and risk associated with industrial control systems and operational technology. Uh, so the, a lot of that pre-qualification and testing work that you see referenced uh, inside the executive order is going to be focused within our office, within within CSER, within our programs, to provide those as a service to the overall effort to help meet the secretary's responsibilities identified in the EO. Uh, now, there is going to be uh, both a request for information that the Department of Information, uh, that the Department of Energy, rather, is uh, is going to be going to be putting out in short order, as well as that notice of propo uh, proposed rulemaking uh, that is going to provide those formal opportunities for stakeholder engagement and comment. Um, so we expect that RFI to come out soon. The notice of proposed rulemaking uh, will a obviously be informed by that first round of input with the RFI, but, uh, but b it'll come out later later in the fall. Uh, so until then, we plan to continue to uh, you know, engage stakeholders through the avenues that we have been using for quite some time. Uh, for the energy sector, a lot of that includes the subsector coordinating councils, which notably are identified as named stakeholders in that process through the language of the EO. And that's both our Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council, or ESCC, and our Oil and Natural Gas Subsector Coordinating Council, or ONGSCC. Yeah, and um, if I'm not mistaken, it was pretty it was pretty unique that you called out those subsector coordinated councils in that EO, correct? That's that's correct. I mean, and, and you you look at some of the other EOs uh, that have been that have been released in recent history. It doesn't really call out that that sort of tangible, strong lash up with subsector coordinating council as as part of the overall national uh, national infrastructure protection mission and how DHS pulls together the NIP in that way. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's it is is definitely notable that they were called out by name, and you know we obviously have a very strong level of collaboration with both of our SCCs, meeting in person multiple times a year, meeting virtually with each of them at least uh, at least once a, once a week, and, uh, and quite a few of those meetings are at are at the CEO level with our with our stakeholders there. So we have a high level of leadership engagement within the industry working directly with our department to help inform a lot of this approach. Uh, and that's important uh, because there's a lot of, we know that there's a lot of angst, there's a lot of concern uh, regarding the executive order in particular. Uh, and a lot of that uh, really kind of comes from some of the, uh, 
some of the thoughts that people have when they look at uh, this as an opportunity for rip and replace. Uh, and there really, there is, there is no rip and replace, you know, authority here within, within the executive order. It's not anticipated to be part of the plan. It's really future facing, not necessarily focused exclusively on what's in place, what's in place now. Yeah, I th look, I think that's important clarification. I'm glad you, you, you brought that up. So this EO is designed to take a look at the, the environment that we have today and for future transactions, because that's one of the things within the EO that it talks about for future transactions, um, that's when some of these processes will begin to kick in. But that won't start until after the opportunity for input and after the proposed rulemaking goes out, is that correct? I mean, is that, are we talking uh, full 180 days plus before actual implementation, or are you guys going to start doing some of this stuff now? Well, I mean, there's there's a lot of work that the Department of Energy um, is is doing as part of its normal course of business for securing the sector, for testing vulnerabilities, for collaborating directly with our sector stakeholders and collaborating with manufacturers. A lot of that work isn't is not going to stop and kind of the threat informed intelligence informed nexus that we take to our work isn't gonna isn't going to stop if anything this is, this is going to continue to stoke that fire and is providing another good opportunity for us to collaborate in a more fulsome way with a lot of these stakeholders uh but but you you are you are correct uh, and and that yes but we once it, it's gonna get through the rulemaking process we have to outline and identify kind of the standards and how we're going to approach this. And a lot of that work is going to be undertaken uh, by the task force that's identified where the Secretary of Energy is charged with this task force approach that's uh, that's not only going to include, like we mentioned earlier, those subsector coordinating councils and being informed by, by their inputs and the, the kind of the, the specialty expertise that they represent, uh, but also includes uh, the Secretaries of Defense, Homeland Security, Commerce, Director of National Intelligence, uh, OMB. It includes a whole litany of stakeholders yeah. to make sure that we're taking a collaborative approach across the federal government space to this as well. And for those companies that are not part of uh, some of the subsector coordinating councils or have not yet participated in some of that, are there are there opportunities outside of the RFI? I'm assuming that both CSER and the uh, Office of Electricity are, are relatively open for continued discussion and collaboration on this. Is that fair statement? Well, it's absolutely fair. So, I mean, so we're we're engaging uh, we're engaging both in you know in places you know like this uh, in this sort of a this sort of a format. Uh, but yeah, we're absolutely we're we're open to business. Our job is to be sector facing. It is not to be not to be inwardly facing. You know, we're a lot of our work. Uh, revolves around that level of interaction that we have. So, uh, a yes, we're absolutely open to continuing to have those those conversations and to continuing to make sure we get people uh, kind of into the right spots within the department. Of those conversations. Uh, so we do have. Uh, if you go look at the the FAQs that we have on our internal page, we do have a uh, we do have a coordinated uh, coordinated inbox uh, that's that's on there. Or uh, I think it's uh, bulk power system EO at hq.hue.gov, just so we can get everybody in the team all between our office of electricity and our office on the seizure side, all looking on the same the same sheet of music uh, with what those requests are that uh, that come in through the front door. Uh, we're also engaging in places like uh, like NARUC, the Regulated Utility Commissioners Association, uh, to coordinate some of these coordinate some of these things with them and have opportunities to go out there and have these conversations. Okay, um, let's let's pivot and talk about some of the process stuff that Caesar is going to have ownership over, because I know that that's one of the things that I've heard uh, repeatedly from our industry partners that that there's some angst around. So um, you, you mentioned Citrix, but DOE has the responsibility for identifying the equipment that is subject to the control of another country and that will pose certain risks. How exactly will that process work? And, and will companies, either ones directly impacted or the ones that are dependent on those impacted companies have an ability to weigh in during the process before those products are um, banned from use? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we, we know that this effort is exceedingly complex and it's require a lot of thoughtfulness and engagement with 
other federal agencies as well as lots of different segments of industry to make sure that it's actually going to be successful. So that's why we're taking that phased approach to leverage the public-private partnerships and to leverage the engagement to identify best practices and you know identify what that intention is uh, and identify what the scope of influence is of uh, potential adversarial nations. Uh, intentions to compromise the bulk power system and our national security. Uh, now, for manufacturers, uh, seizure plans to, to utilize our supply chain testing and our enumeration capabilities kind of as a service to affirm the security of those components they, that they produce. And a lot of that is done through our through our Citrix program. Um, so we do have you know, manufacturer agreements where we can engage collaboratively in that testing. Uh, to look at systemic and individual vulnerabilities, uh, as well as to look at uh, kind of you know, what would be some of the recommendations we would make in terms of best practices and remediation going forward. And then we work those jointly with with manufacturer, with the vendor that's affected to kind of take them take them through that. Um, so we do that, um, and we, we want to recognize that kind of those who own, operate, and produce equipment, in particular for critical infrastructure segments, have a special responsibility because of those assets importance to national security, to economic security, and to safety of life. So we're working through some of our programs, uh, even in some of our pilot programs, like the ones that were established by Section 5726 of the NDAA last year, uh, to be non-prescriptive, uh, but to help shore up that private sector responsibility to secure critical infrastructure that it manufactures and that it operates. And we're prioritizing those components that we test based on uh, ubiquity, prevalence, criticality, and national security needs across the sector. And we're coming up with kind of a common scoring methodology right now for how we prioritize uh, those testing efforts related to the energy sector. And will industry have an opportunity to uh, weigh in on that methodology? Um, is, there, is there an opportunity to kind of have that dialogue with you about what you're coming up with? Or is that part of the, what you're talking about right now? Yeah, so I think that's part of what we're talking about uh, right now, but I think uh, much more much more broadly. Uh, yeah, I, I think the RFI process is really going to help inform this. I think a lot of the work that uh, that NERC is getting ready to to put out, I think helps to in helps to inform this. I think a lot of the dialogue that we have with our our SCCs, um, you know, whether that's through threat information exchange or through program specific briefings and engagement, gives us an opportunity for that to, for that to be informed. Uh, we're primarily using those as our mechanisms right now for the level of feedback uh, that we're that we're engaged in in that process. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're absolutely hopeful that as we engage in these manufacturer agreements uh, through programs like Citrix, that those manufacturers don't just engage in the dialogue regarding the specific vulnerabilities in the reporting process and how we engage there, but they have us feedback on how overall the program is helping to support their security programs and how we can continue to improve it. So. Uh Quick aside before we before we keep going, I know we're we're getting close to time. Um, I do appreciate that you mentioned your C2M2 program is tied to the NIST cybersecurity framework, and I also saw that FERC just came out with a um, with a Federal Register notice about uh, how they're taking a look at their process and overlaying it with the cybersecurity framework. So I think that that's helpful. I think that's again promoting some common use and common standards across the board. So I just put that out there in the, in the ether. Um, the last question about the EO before we, before we kind of wrap up and take a look at what we have uh, is how does the EO, the bulk power EO interact and interrelate with the ICT EO that came out in May of 2019? Yeah, so the ICT EO, uh, for its most part, is kind of inwardly focused on government processes and procedures. And while ours includes that as well, uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, it doesn't necessarily do as much with industry collaboration, where we actively see that collaboration and that inclusion on our on our senior level task force uh, task force membership. It's there. Uh, don't get don't get me wrong. Uh, and the approach that CISA has taken, I think, has been has been pretty strong in bringing lots of different stakeholders to the table. Uh, we see those interrelations, uh, inter interrelationships where you, know, you, you see things with the government collaboration that we have going on today, where DHS and their ICT supply chain risk management task force, you know, we're we are a member of that. We're we're sitting in their groups, vice versa. 
DHS co-chairs our events, whether it's SEC events or it's these pilot programs that we're taking on to kind of keep keep everything aligned and moving. And uh, when you start to look at places like commerce, you know, it's, it's not really a mistake that, you know, commerce started uh, started looking at things like, you know, uh, you know, electricity components all at the same time that the CEO was coming out and the Department of Energy was starting to, to stand up to take these sort of actions related to the EO. Uh, so, I mean, there really is a collaborative across the board, whole of government approach to taking this on and solving, solving these problems. Yeah, and, and look, I, I think that one of the things, again, when we were talking earlier, that, that uh, the industry perspective is that we, we want to be, we want to have some assurances that inside of the government, the interagency process is actually working to make sure that we're not putting out things that do not talk to each other and that are not interrelated when it comes to ICT and ICS and the impact that they're both having on the supply chain, what that what that actually looks like. So I'm, it's good to hear from you that that is uh, the case and those dialogues are happening internally. Um, if we have, I know we're, we're button up on time, but there was a, a, a few questions that came in over the over the course of our discussion. Um, and if you're game and you have, you have a few more minutes to answer just a few more? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great, 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 great. Um, all right, so a couple of these should be quick. Can you give us a date or time for the issuance of the RFI? Is that a known? Is that known at this point in time? No, I I sure cannot. Uh, so I can tell you, it's actively being worked, and it's a, it's in short order that we hope to uh, that we hope to get it out. Uh, but I, I can't I can't give you a specific date. Okay. Um, next question is um, from. Uh, there's a question about state and local uh, engagement and your team's engagement in this, especially as uh, you do some of the work around the security aspects uh, related to and underpinning the, or the threat aspects underpinning the, uh, the EO. Um, how are you working with state state uh, coordinators to, to make sure that this is a, a unified effort? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I mean, we're, we're, we work pretty we work pretty regularly with with all of our SLTT partners. You know, we have a whole segment of our office devoted uh, just to doing that. We work a lot of our projects uh, in close coordination with a lot of the, the state based organizations, with NGA, uh, with NGA, with NASIO, with NARUC, with NEMA. You know, just kind of the list, the list goes on and on with all the all the organizations that we work with. Um, so, our regular engagement. Them is is important. Uh, I'm going to be you know sharing some additional information, or I'm sure they be having very similar conversation with uh, with NARU with their their summer policy summit uh, very shortly about supply chain risk. Uh, and we're we're regularly engaged in state dialogue, whether it's helping to coordinate uh, classified threat information sharing with the state based uh, organizations, um, with the utility commissioners as an example. Uh, or it's through just the, the bringing them into to the programs that we develop and make sure that they're able to take advantage of the same types of resources that we're investing in, uh, because there is a real extension of services where this covers the bulk power system. Uh, it, you know, in, in particular, that's a, 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 a smaller but an exceedingly critical segment of the power system. States and locals in particular have a, have a much more broad segment of the overall energy system uh, and we want to make sure that they're also well informed by the process that we're that we're taking on. Great, great, thank you. Uh, look, I, I want to say that I, I really appreciate your willingness to come on, and I hope that you would would continue to come on and, and have these conversations with folks. We have more questions, but we'll make sure that the questions that have come in on top of that are, are funneled to you guys, and and that you're able to communicate with them uh, with the folks who are asking uh, directly. But we thank you for for your openness and for the conversation. We hope you'll you'll stick around uh, to to listen in to the industry panel that we have coming up next. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you all having me, and we're, we're certainly we're happy to come back. Happy to come back anytime. Happy to keep answering questions. You know, collaboration in this area is especially important to us going forward. Thank you very much, Nick. All right. So if our panelists could uh, come online, and Nick, if you want to mute the, the TV and the buttons, perfect. All right. So for the folks on watching at home, uh, we're going to switch over to our industry panel. Um, and I want to I want to set the stage a little bit and say, first of all, thank the, the panelists for joining us. Um, 
for this discussion. I think it's it's great. We have a we have a uh, a good swath of the environment. We've got uh, some manufacturers on the panel. We also have some folks who are part of the energy production industry, and we have the some uh, uh, company representing and understanding the cyber threat environment that's driving some of the stuff that we're talking about right now. So. With that, I'll turn it over for our panelists right now to to give uh, their own introductions. Let's start with uh, Megan, and then Nadav, and then Jim, and then uh, Peter. So Megan, you could give a quick introduction and talk about where you where you're coming from. No, sure. Thank you, Ross, and thank you very much for the center for for hosting this today, and thank you, uh, thank you, Nick, for covering the aspects of the executive order that you did. So a little bit about myself, I'm Megan Sanford. I'm the director of both product safety and security for Rockwell Automation. We are an American-based but yet global company, and we're the largest company in the world that provides industrial control systems products for industrial automation. And with that, uh, my background prior to coming to Rockwell, I um, led product security incident response for General Electric, which obviously plays a huge role in this space, as well as Rockwell Automation. And I was with the government before that, where I had the awesome opportunity to lead critical infrastructure protection at the state level for both governors, Tim Kaine and Bob McDonald. A unique thing I think about my perspective as well is that I continue to remain involved with um, supporting Department of Homeland Security and DOE in the development and review and crafting of this policy work. I think it's important work. Nick had mentioned tie-in with the emergency support function structure, which is how the federal government organizes under the national response framework with state, local, tribal, territorial, government, uh, private sector, nonprofit liaisons. It's basically our response structure for how we respond to, uh, to disasters so that they don't eventually become catastrophes. Uh, very involved in that work, and we're spearheading an effort now called uh, Incident Command System for Industrial Control Systems that's interesting in that it hits at a lot of the key points of government and private sector interaction that Nick spoke of earlier. But looking forward to being on the panel and responding to some Q&A and reacting to some of the questions from the audience. So thank you. Great. You know? Thanks, Ross, and thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. So in terms of my uh, personal background, uh, I'm the president and vice chairman at Clarity, which I'll say a couple of words about, uh, and we work closely uh, with Rockwell uh, uh, on creating a cybersecurity framework for the industrial control systems. Before uh, joining Clarity, um, I, was, uh, I spent the first part of my career in the military in Israel, especially in tech and Intel. Uh, and I headed Unit 8200, uh, which uh, for those of you who haven't heard about it before, somewhat uh, of the equivalent of the NSA uh, on the Israeli side. Uh, about seven years ago, I was one of the founders of Team 8. Uh, what Team 8 does, it's a platform for company building, uh, and we differentiate our process by looking for big problems and trying to solve these big problems in a fundamental way by pulling together resources that are quite unique in terms of talent and perspectives and creating a very diligent de-risking process before we actually launch. And the second problem that we focused on is exactly what we're here to talk about today. And in a nutshell, the way I see it, the conundrum uh, is that on the one hand, we have an industry which is critical, which has been around for 100 years, converging into the very modern world, we want to have both and we want to balance this efficiency, effectiveness, productiveness with security. In order to do that, and this is sort of the gist of the problem that we are out to solve, you actually need to understand the protocols or the languages of the different suppliers of this equipment that's been around for decades, now converging at an ever increasing speed to the internet. Um, and what we are really good at is discerning those protocols, putting them together, creating a baseline so that we can do both. That is, on the one hand, create a safe environment. On the other hand, we don't want to stop innovation so that we can get a cleaner, better, more efficient, more effective grid. That's great. We look forward to digging in more of the threat environment with you. Uh, Jim. 
Hi, Ross. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks for everybody for being here. Um, my name is Jim Lamanna with some with ABB, and I'm the global cybersecurity manager for our, our products and platform. Uh, I've been with the company about 25 years and started out in our power generation business unit, uh, delivering systems and engineering custom solutions for customers in that uh, that market. Uh, about 10 years ago, I moved into our product development organization as we were building up our cybersecurity processes and programs to address the challenges in OT cybersecurity, uh, as well as aligning ourselves for compliance to international standards and the coming governmental regulations where they're applicable. So uh, ABB is a, a large company globally uh, headquartered in, in Switzerland, but we operate here in the U.S. and have a significant presence um, where we have over 60 manufacturing facilities in this country and uh, operating in 32 states. So ABB is uh, one of the largest DCS suppliers in the world. DCS uh, distributed control systems were specifically called out in the executive order. And so uh, we have a lot of experience uh, working with the federal government and the national labs, uh, participating in, in exercises such as CyberStorm and GridX. And so we think we have a lot to bring to the table and we'd like to have an opportunity to um, tell you about the types of product testing that we already do and how we view the international standards as a good vehicle for for getting products and, and system deliveries uh, up to the, the expectations of, of our markets and our customers and, and, and federal regulations. Great, thank you, Jim. And then last but not least, Peter. Thanks, Ross. Uh, Peter Watts, I'm a senior cybersecurity advisor for a Fortune 20 company in the energy industry. My comments today uh, are done in a private capacity. Before uh, coming to the private sector, I spent nearly 17 years in the U.S. government. My last assignment was at the White House National Security Council, where I was the director for cybersecurity policy, specifically focusing on strategic operations and response, uh, particularly as it concerns critical infrastructure. Before that, uh, nearly 15 years at the Central Intelligence Agency as an operations officer. That's uh, helpful. Thank you all for being here. Awesome. Uh, I really appreciate, really appreciate it. Um, so let's uh, let's jump in. So start with Peter and Nadav real quick. Can you guys uh, give us an understanding of the threat environment? Uh, what are the major threats that you guys are seeing out there that you think are, is driving DOE's need to put out this executive order, especially now? Sure, Ross, I'd be happy to comment on that. So. Threats to uh, critical infrastructure in SCADA have been around for quite a long time. In the last uh, 10 years in particular, there's been a lot of focus on this topic. And most of this fo focus has been on cyber attacks against vulnerabilities and control systems, interfaces, firmware, and related software, uh, all of which can ultimately be assessed remotely, uh, either through uh, systems that are open and completely undefended, segmented systems with protection, and in some cases, even uh, systems that are air-gapped. Um, however, uh, recently supply chain, um, hardware uh, supply chain security concerns, ultimately what this EO addresses have received a lot more attention. Uh, that's not entirely surprising. Um, supply chain threats uh, represent an evolution of uh, this existing critical infrastructure threat that we've known for uh, 10 to 15 plus years. Uh, hardware supply chain threats are uh, very difficult to undertake. They're costly, uh, require a lot of manpower and coordination, uh, a lot of technical expertise, but uh, they're also extremely hard to detect. Uh, they're persistent and uh, in many respects, they're like the ultimate Trojan horse with the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, I would imagine they can be uh, triggered in a number of different ways uh, from the outside in or more importantly from the inside out. And that um, very importantly uh, defeats uh, segmentation uh, and air gaps. And it could give uh, um, adversaries uh, quite a bit of an advantage. Uh, uh, therefore, I think it's uh, extremely important that uh, the DOE and the private sector uh, are looking into this and uh, developing mitigations. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll echo that. Yeah, I'll echo that, Ross. I think uh, uh, Peter's right. Um, you know, warfare has been around forever. Um, cyber as another 
domain for nation state confrontation is also not a new concept. However, the interconnectivity or the hyperconnectivity, almost the inevitable hyperconnectivity as our networks become more and more connected uh, as we modernize them, that's a new phenomena. And it drives new opportunities as this attack surface grows. And, you know, we can expect um, the owners or the people that protect these grids uh, to do their best effort in terms of cybersecurity. However, there are some very high level targeted nation state capabilities that it would be hard to expect the owners, uh, the private owners or the quasi private owners to be able to withstand by themselves. I think an implant of a hardware is one of them where it's almost impossible for every one of the utilities to take care of themselves. And so there are certain things where you must have some kind of government support in order to create a safety environment. One of them is the supply chain at its very core. And so I commend this EO. I think it's the right, uh, it's a right step uh, in the right direction. There are other areas that I think government needs to step in because I think private organizations are not going to be able to solve them, right? So, for example, you know, intelligence is obviously very, very important. You don't expect a private organization to collect intelligence worldwide to know what's coming at them. Obviously, attribution. Uh, uh, and other things that government needs to interfere, and this is one of them. So I think this is a good start. Great, and Megan and, and Jim, do y'all have any reactions to that? I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah, no, sure. Everything that Nadav said, um, we have a very similar view on the way that we're assessing risk, both within our environment as well as our customer environments. And Clarity has been an awesome strategic partner in that they bring unique skills and products to the table that that we need to better support our customers in turn. In regard to kind of our initial reaction or vendor or industry reaction to the executive order, if you look at the spirit and the intent of the language within the policy, they're acknowledging that they don't have all the answers, right? This is clearly a, a goodwill call to action to the industry saying that we need to wrap our arms around the problem. I've, uh, I've said to folks, if you're a supplier to the US Department of Defense today, um, you already should be complying to 99% of everything that's outlined in the executive order through the 2018 DFAR supplemental that came out regarding hardware and software supply chain integrity, which is many of the elements that Nadab mentioned earlier. And we are aware and we do know of ways to better mitigate against risk to our supply chain from an upstream standpoint in the way that vendors and other competitors in the space uh, approach sourcing their components, right? We know that we can do random sampling of components to examine things at the microchip level to ensure that there's not additional back doors that um, when we purchase something, we are purchasing exactly what has been ordered to spec, nothing more and nothing less. And in turn, we want to pass on that traceability and that expectation to our own customers. And I think that that's a key component of it is just down and basic good product development, right? Good product development handles a lot of this understanding and applying defense in depth in the customer environments is another key piece of this. Yeah, and just following up on the dog, and, 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 you know, it's, it's correct. We can't expect that the uh, all these end users and in, in, of the systems that are in the bulk electric system can do the hard work that the, the addressing threats from nation states. I mean, the, the federal government has enormous resources that they can bring to bear and can help. Um, but we do think it, it makes a lot of sense to, to not just focus on those end operators and owners because and that's a lot of targets to have to cover and that the, the vendors that supply are common for, for many of those owners and operators. And, and, and we already have programs where we're looking to ensure product cybersecurity. So, in working with us to make sure we understand what the expectation is, we can have aligned our internal processes to help ensure that these 
issues don't arise in supply chain uh, compromise and that product security is is properly looked after and meet, meet the needs of the market and the, and the regulations, whatever they may be. Okay, and, and look, I, I, I think that, that's great that, that one, that DOE is open, two, that uh, some of the folks who are, who are with industry feel as though, you know, there's, there's not that big of a gap yet. There's still some nervousness and unanswered questions around the language that was in the EO. And I think that's one of the things that we, we started to cover with Nick a little bit, but want to cover in addition with you guys. Right. And I know Nadav, and we were talking about it yesterday. We talked about the idea of what, what is, you know, there's a definition in there for foreign adversary. It says any government or foreign non-government person engaged in a long-term pattern or series uh, serious instances of conduct significantly adverse to the national security of the United States or its allies or the security and safety of the United States persons, right? That's the definition that they have in the EO right now. What does significantly adverse mean and, and how do you tackle something like that? Nadav, you any thoughts on that? So look, I, you know, this is the, the as, as said before, this is an extremely complex supply chain um, on the one hand. And so, elements of our control systems, even if they're, you know, produced in one country, obviously are interconnected to a very broad uh, uh, ecosystem around them. So the definition has to be very specific, you know, without naming any names, uh, uh, I think we can all imagine uh, who and why we're talking about, you know, who might have the interest in harming this infrastructure, either for getting uh, IP that they don't own uh, or for having a red button so that if some other controversy arises in another area, they can use this asymmetric means uh, of warfare. Because remember, many of the US uh, uh, adversaries uh, really don't have the capability in other domains to really be a threat, right? You know, if, if we're speaking about a country like uh, um, North Korea uh, 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 take down uh, uh, nukes and stuff like that. You know they don't have a navy to go out and attack. But cybersecurity in its nature is asymmetric. So small groups, small nations, and even quasi nation states and non nation states can have a real impact uh, by using very shrewd entry points and have a major impact. Uh, on the vitality of the economy, way of life, et cetera. And so on the one hand, we need to be very direct in understanding what adversarial means, right? And on the other side, we need to be very direct in what allies mean, because it, no one is an island. The utility is not an island, the US is not an island. So we need to understand where can we uh, source our supplies uh, from allies put together a system where we can also use our allies to see the, can the canary in the wharf, if you might, so that we can see other attacks in other places and have intelligence of what's coming our way. So, you know, long answer to a uh, short uh, question. I think it's almost obvious who those adversaries are. We need to be very focused on understanding that we cannot create an island. And do you guys think that the process set up in the EO and the, the way it's described gives us the opportunity to define that clearly enough? I mean, I, I guess my question is, is there a way to get rid of the, the ambiguity around those definitions in order to really make this something that the, uh, uh, um, targets exactly what you're talking about? And I, that's open to anybody on the panel. I think that we are. And I think that in the future, one of the deliverables I would expect to see coming out of the task force is a process to evaluate and adjudicate companies that end up on a whitelist or on a blacklist that the government owns and um, puts out for review. The, the adjudication process will play a big role in the equities that we would want to see from a private sector standpoint. And I think it's up to the private sector to be good stewards and to be good partners to the government in providing direct and honest feedback. But make no mistake, I mean, the definition of war is politics by another means, right? 
So with this, we we know that there's work to do. We know that um, it's going to be a lot of back and forth and policy making. But myself, I I'm personally seeing more of a capable outreach and pull from the government to solicit this type of conversation than we have in the past. Whether or not that shakes out in a proper adjudication process, you know, I think that that will depend on the willingness of the private sector to come to the table and help the government with the language. Yeah. Uh, Jim, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's critical that those definitions are made clear because we can't have individuals organizations deciding that uh, what they feel is an adversarial nation and how they view their supply chain is is not exposed. Um, so I think there needs to be clarity around that point. Okay. Um, let's pivot a little bit to kind of the process described within the EO. Um, the officials have indicated that there are, uh, they'll be continued engaged with industry through RFI processes, rulemaking processes, industry forms, um, uh, are there other, first of all, are there other ways that uh, they should be considering outreach? Is there is there something that we're missing? I mean, I asked Nick the question earlier. Are there other avenues? And he said, of course, come come to us directly. But what else should uh, should DOE know and hear? What other forms do they have to go out and reach out and talk to industry? What other touch points do they have? One of the things for us as a vendor is we, we, we've seen that uh, some previous attempts at rulemaking um, said tend to focus on those owners and operators and, and going to this next level and, and, and talking to vendors and bringing them into the process, we think is a, a deepening of the maturing of our, our approach to developing regulations to ensure the, the protection of our bulk electric system. And so that's that's a very important step. We're not involved with the uh, electric subsector. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're not a participant because we're a vendor, not a, not a stakeholder. And so we need some vehicle by which we can convene and share yep. best practices and, and communicate that. Yeah. And then look, and, and we, there are the DHS has a manufacturing, uh, subsector, uh, mm -hmm. as well, but that wasn't specifically identified the EO. Peter, I mean, I guess based on your previous experience, do you think they're open to talking to other subsector coordinating councils? Yeah, I think uh, EISAC, the ONG, uh, the SEC are good examples of uh, uh, places to reach out to. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of uh, organizations there may have uh, insight into a uh, specific insight and uh, technical expertise into how this may affect them uh, and uh, related operations, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, the Department of Energy, uh, um, Assistant Secretary Walker, Daz Anderson have been uh, really good about uh, being transparent on the topic and engaging uh, uh, outside members or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, companies and other organizations and would definitely uh, encourage them to continue doing that and applaud their efforts. Okay. Um, let's go on to the, the uh, point that it's, uh, a, a forward-looking EO. In regard to the section about prohibition over certain transactions and then uh, then follow on recommended mitigations for those um, prohibitions, what would DOE need to do to make sure that those processes are set up in a way that doesn't unduly impact industry? That's one of the, the big concerns that I've heard from numerous folks. I go back to, I think everyone is really hyper-focused on, is there going to be development of a list? Is there gonna be a white list for saying, you're good and you're you're an approved vendor, we have the national labs, we've run your products through qualification, which by the way, I think that would be a um, helpful thing that the labs already do, and I think that they're well-equipped to do it, and I think that any government um, concerned with their critical infrastructure should have a capability to assess products that lie within its critical infrastructures. That's kind of just table stakes of a good program. That's going to keep the government understanding the space and understanding the threats. On the private sector side, again, going back to is there a list, is there not a list, you're going to decrease a lot of the anxiety if you say that, um, say there is a list, we're going to have a process where you might get on the list and then there's a way to get off of it if you can provide evidence to the contrary. So. It becomes a process of uh, equitable adjudication, as I mentioned earlier, and I think that that's one of the key things that um, the private sector is going to um, kind of call to the government and say, what do we want to do about this? Because that would be the number one way that the private sector, at least, would perceive itself being damaged or, or not heard in such a way that 
um, you're you're creating policy that hurts uh, that hurts the private sector. It's almost like tax law, right? If you if you make a, a slight tweak and you don't understand exactly what you're doing, there can be cascading impacts that take companies out of business. And I don't think that that's at the heart of the CEO. I don't think that that's the spirit of it. Um, and so I, you're gonna you're gonna see that those conversations taking place, but there's certainly a way to do it. Sure, and and I think one of the yeah. points that I've heard raised. Uh, Jim, and I think this may be a point, is that does, does energy, even in, in conjunction with the national labs, have the capacity and ability to tackle that that process in an equitable manner? It, not just the process of managing the list, but the, uh, you know, the labs doing the tests. And we have our own internal testing organizations, and we have many products, and we require that they get tested at each release. And it, it took quite some time to do it's a centralized testing facility that uh, tests all of the different ABB products from different divisions. And it, it took quite an effort to get them up to speed so where they could actually conduct a functional test on a product that's so uh, purpose-built and unique as, a, as an embedded device in an industrial control system. So it's not just something you can uh, turn on and it, the light goes green and if the attack is successful, the light turns red. It's, it's much more complicated in evaluating the functionality of a product like that. And to do this on a regular basis with all the various products, uh, we're, we're, we're not certain that the labs can scale. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I'd like to echo that, uh, uh, Ross, if I may. This is a, uh, a very complex ecosystem. Uh, and the adversaries are going to be very sophisticated and very subtle. Uh, and so Nick said something about being descriptive uh, rather than prescriptive. I think uh, the EO, as as it uh, you know, as it manifests, should have the parameters um, that we should adhere to, or the companies um, that are, you know, whitelisted, quote unquote, adhere to uh, different parameters um, that are constantly checked, because at the end of the day. If, 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 the, if these adversarial nations are going to uh, implement something into the system, this is not going to be through the front door. This is not you know, an, a, 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 a carrier that you're going to see coming your way. This could be very subtle. It could look and speak different languages. And so it's very important that we, and it needs to be constantly checked. Um, because some of the, because, you know, the EO is also forward looking. We don't have a way to assess the situation right now that we don't have anything in the systems already. In my opinion, the only way to really come up with a sustainable system uh, to assure that we don't have these things in our system right now or coming in the future is to monitor the network traffic all mm -hmm. the time and to monitor the network traffic by aggregating all the data points that are going within those sites and from those sites to the outside world. Remember, none of these utilities in, is an island either, and they don't own their own IT infrastructure systems, right? And so as the world gets more and more hyper-connected, and we don't want to stop that because that's a good trajectory, they're also going to be dependent on the IT infrastructure giants that give them the connectivity. And so in my opinion, and this is what we are so almost obsessed and focused on at Clarity and working with our, our friends at, uh, and, and, and partners at Rockwell, is constantly monitoring the network traffic and leaving no stone unturned in the sense that even though some of these protocols are proprietary, at the end of the day, we can't have a Tower of Babel. We need to constantly monitor every piece of bit and byte on the system. We need to create a baseline and see anomalies all the time. And that will enable us to see if there's any component in the whole ecosystem that has been tampered with uh, in or as a red button or something that's going to be operated right now. Okay. I, I want to pause one second. Peter, I want to ask, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, give me one second, Peter. I just want to note the time. It's, it's uh, about six past four. Uh, we have this for another 10, 15 minutes if we want to stay on and we can answer some audience questions as well. But I did want to just make sure that the audience was aware that we, we are going to be on for at least another uh, 10 minutes. Or so. Peter, Peter, comment for you uh, from you on that. 
So, Ross, really briefly, uh, I'd also underscore the comments about uh, being scoped in implementation. Uh, a lot of organizations, uh, in particular utilities, for instance, uh, don't have a lot of capital or resources necessarily, especially in this economy and environment. And uh, there could be potential operational impact and the secondary implications as well related to uh, procurement, future plans, uh, future equipment compatibility, and whether or not they meet their own organization's uh, criteria. Um, I'd also uh, recommend thinking about how the EO, uh, to the extent possible, uh, impacts areas outside of the bulk power system. Obviously, it's focused on uh, BPS, but some of the equipment in, uh, mentioned in the EO, such as safety instrumented systems and HMIs or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, control systems really ha could have impact in uh, other areas. Uh, refineries are a big example, for instance. Um, finally, I'd add that um, there's been a lot of focus relatively on um, relatively near-term threats to critical infrastructure. There's uh, a lot of new tech coming online all the time. And so the task force uh, charged with implementation should really take a look at um, how this can apply uh, uh, to the industries over the next few years, over the next couple of decades, because there's a lot of uh, significant changes that will be taking place. Um, Jim, I want to I want to turn to a point that that uh, I know you were talking about when we were preparing for this a little bit. Um, so Nick mentioned that, and and Nadav, you said there's there's we're starting new, we're starting fresh, and you brought up that point. But at the same time. Nick mentioned going back to what NERC's putting out and taking a look at some of the, you know, he he, he brought up the C2M2 and how it's tied to the, the assessment around the NIST cybersecurity framework. Yeah. So that, that could, in theory, act as some of the base for us to, to have an understanding. But is there is there other standards that we probably should be taking into consideration? I know that you guys have done some work around an international standard with ISA. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, the NIST framework is, is great, and, and we do align to the NIST framework, um, but uh, we look at something like IEC 6243 is much more comprehensive. Um, it addresses the, really the entire life cycle from uh, the development of a product. Are you properly gathering your security requirements, and are you evaluating the impact that security requirements might have on, on the product stability and, and robustness? Are you developing that process, uh, product in a secure manner? Do you have a security life life cycle process? Security development life cycle process is a requirement for 6443. And then it, it also touches on aspects around the, the configuration by the system integrator. Are, are, are they doing that properly? Are they, do they understand their, their, their role in ensuring that the system itself is secure? And then the requirements on the owner operator for the maintenance because the system doesn't stay secure just because you delivered it secure. Uh, you know, so it's a comprehensive standard with many different parts, and uh, we've been aligning our, our internal programs to that standard, and we're and they actually offer external certification where you can use a third party to evaluate your, your product, your development cycle, your maintenance practices, and you can become certified by these third party independent assessors to uh, assure that you've met the requirements in your program. Um, we also have requirements on supply chain. So the same requirements that we enforce upon ourselves with respect to cybersecurity, we expect those of our suppliers. Um, that's not, we can't be everywhere and, and, and audit everybody and ensure they're doing that, but that's uh, that's what we're asking them to do. Um, so we, we'd like to see some, some plans that we can use to internalize and help support this effort and not be fully dependent upon uh, uh, governmental labs or organizations to to make sure that we're doing our diligence. We want to we want to know the rules and do them, uh, you know, organically. So I'll double down on that, Jim, if you don't mind. Yes, we sure. we are in the same camp, and um, we um, four dash one is the six two four four three standard that Jim is talking about for product development. We as well get the third party uh, certification from TUV Rhineland. And on the product side, I'd say if you're a customer in the area, to Jim's point, look out to see if your vendor is certified against the 62443 standard because 
It's actually a controls-based standard, whereas NIST is a risk management framework. So they're kind of two different animals, but I see people using the terminology interchangeably. Around. They're not wrong necessarily, but they're just used for different applications. And uh, one point I do want to bring up just for any of the audience members or especially a ABB, Jim, and that we're hoping you all will join along with us, but through ISA, the home of the 62443 standard, Rockwell Automation and Schneider Electric co-founded the ISA Global Cybersecurity Alliance with our vendor competitors. So, I mean, this was pretty landmark in that it was a bunch of vendors getting together to say, we want to do better together, even though we're competitors, we believe that this is a space that we all can coalesce around. So yeah, definitely check maybe, out we, ISA we, we, if you can too, but we yeah. definitely support some 62443 reinforcement through this EO. I think we've got to find some way to align because, you know, ABB started their own OT cybersecurity alliance almost at the same time. And uh, I think somehow our ship's passed. <laughs> we, we can rectify yeah. that. No, we, we'd love to have you too. Okay. Great. Great. Um, Peter, I want to pivot real quick. Uh, anything that you can say about other broader industry standards that we should take into consideration as well. That was one of the audience questions that came in. And I thought it was interesting. Is there anything else in addition to this particular one that from even from a producer side um, or even a distributor side that energy should be taking into consideration that you know of? And if not, that's fine. I, I was just well. That's fine. Yeah, and we can we can circle back with you on that. But I just I thought it was interesting. Like there are there are a series of standards to include the one that you just talked about um, that Department of Energy should be taking a look at to take into consideration as they work through how best to develop these processes and lists. Okay, so we are at time. I want to go around real quick and offer you guys an opportunity to say anything else you want when you close uh, as as a close. So we'll start with uh, we'll start in the reverse order we went. We'll start with Jim. Uh, and then end with Peter. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any specific closing I wanted to, to make. I just uh, reiterate that uh, we think that there's a, a lot that can be brought to the table um, from the vendor community and that uh, we want to make sure that we're fully engaged in, in any kind of rulemaking process or have the ability to provide information because we would like to see this thing work well and be efficient and uh, I don't think it's going to be a success unless we all kind of get aligned and, and get the proper input from all stakeholders. Great. Um, Nidav? Sure. So, you know, to say the obvious, we, we really can't afford to have a, 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 an electric system that's not resilient. You know, it's, it's what took us as a civilization to really prosper. Now, this is such a big challenge. Um, we have generations of decades of ICS equipment already out there, interconnecting to a totally modern system. So at some point we have a turbine that in some way is connected to a smart home meter. That's the ecosystem that we're talking about. If we don't come together as an industry and open it up for bug bounty programs, uh, and if we don't have the support of the government, there is no way we are going to continue the trajectory of making a more efficient, more effective, cleaner system and remain resilient. So I think what we're doing out here right now is super important uh, and it's really a team sport. So just like the EO has the concept of adversarial nation, we need to see who are the ally nations, who are the different players you know, from the ICS vendors, ABB, uh, Rockwell, Schneider, et cetera, but also the cybersecurity uh, vendors, just like us at Clarity, if I may, that have the ability to dig into these archeological layers of decades of equipment that speak different languages so that we can put everybody on the same platform. Okay. Megan. Uh, yes, just thank you again. Thanks for having us on the panel. Uh, I've greatly enjoyed the discussion. Uh, it's the old adage, you know, security is a journey. I'd say anyone out there that just has questions around industrial control system security, the 62443 standard, anything like that, 
um, reach out to us, ISAGCA. I'm sure Jim would, would welcome the opportunity as well from ABB. We do want to help more. We want to become more involved. And I think the CISO community, you know, got a head start 15 or 20 years ago and, and they've matured and look at the progress that's happened there. And I think we want to copy and paste very similarly and that this community is growing as well. And I'm just very thankful that the government has has opened up with, uh, you know, kind of open arms, embracing our feedback. It's like I said, it's very different than what I've seen in the past, and we look forward to being a part of the conversation. Great, and then uh, thank you very much. And then Peter. Ross, to answer your previous question, uh, uh, software bill of materials uh, may be an interesting standard, although not a standard per se. Uh, Department of Commerce is involved in some very interesting uh, programs uh, surrounding that. But uh, to close, uh, final comments, I just say and underscore that to the extent possible, it's really critical to be open with uh, supporting intelligence when it comes to implementing the uh, EO. Um, uh, having worked in intelligence and policy, I realize there's um, limits to what can be shared by government for extremely good reasons. But having additional specific context on why something is a threat and under what circumstances it's dangerous can be highly beneficial. Uh, the underlying information can help organizations uh, uh, think through the problem and build the best mitigations possible. It also prompts a lot of entities to think more holistically or broadly about uh, the potential threats uh, to their organization, to their sector. Uh, and finally, I close with uh, um, uh, just a comment that the EO is a, a, a great uh, test of uh, public-private partnership in cyber and uh, critical infrastructure security. And we should definitely take a look at uh, how this works and how we can uh, apply the best points from this cooperation going forward. Yeah, and I'll uh, I'll echo that. Uh, first of all, thank you all for, for joining us and, and sticking around for as long as you did. And uh, look, I, after talking to, to Nick and, and hearing from you guys, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on uh, being able to do what we need to do to work together to get over some of the obscure points within the EO, right? So I think that we we have open dialogue right now. We're going to maintain those uh, those open avenues of discussion and dialogue, and and, and we'll we'll keep pushing until we get it right. But thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you for to the Center for Cybersecurity Policy and Law for letting us uh, letting us do this, and uh, give you the rest of the afternoon back. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Thank you.